much. Uh, well, hi everyone. Welcome to the 27th annual Belva Lockwood Award celebration. Uh, my name is Ty Williams and I am the current president of the GW Law Association for Women. I'd like to thank all of you for coming to this event. Um, I think it's always great to see students and alumni coming together. Um, I wanted to inform you all about some exciting news about our organization's updated mission statement, which is to promote greater awareness of gender inequities and other issues affecting women and femme aligned individuals. Uh, we want to provide an accessible and empowering space for women, including but not limited to transgender, gender non-conforming and non-binary individuals who may identify with women's experiences and to help those students achieve their legal aspirations by creating opportunities for professional development and community. So now more than ever, um, during this period of isolation and uncertainty, it's so important that we all come together to support one another. Uh, the Law Association for Women has worked hard throughout the semester to serve not only as a resource for other law students, but also as an extended community and support system. Today, after this current event, uh, we're actually providing an opportunity for students to meet with some professors in small groups in a more informal setting to discuss career paths, classes, and legal interests. Uh, we've also invited numerous women identifying alumni to speak with students about their practice areas and the barriers they face as women attorneys, especially in legal environments that are often still male dominated and sexist. Uh, women of color in particular are further confronted with the intersection of race and gender um, and, and the discrimination that goes with that. And I'm sure that not only I, but many of my peers, even Dean Matthew and our honoree Danielle Conway can attest to that. There are so many ways that we just can show solidarity and support for our legal community and beyond, whether it's through nationwide movements like Black Lives Matter or the push to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, as some of you may recall. Um, on a more local GW law level, you might consider supporting law students by becoming an alumni mentor or volunteering to speak about your legal career at a future events. And if you have the financial means, you might even contribute to student scholarships so more individuals can access the incredible education and career opportunities GW law has to offer. And of course, please continue attending wonderful events like this. Uh, so I'd now like to welcome Nancy Houlihan, the Associate Vice President of Development and Alumni Relations to say a few words. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Ty. Gosh, it's so good to see you again. We've, we've spent a lot of time together this semester on these screens. You've been an amazing student leader and um, thank you for that, for that welcome. Um, thank you for helping us to kick off the 27th annual Belva Lockwood celebration. Um, as Ty said, I work in development and alumni relations with the law school, and it's a privilege to be here with all of you today. While we are disappointed that we could not gather in person for this occasion, I'm excited to see all of the people um, the, that allowed us to sort of broaden our reach across the nation, including our colleagues from Penn State, who um, are in their homes and, and still able to join us versus being in person in DC. Um, and I see uh, what, what we're gonna do is the Belva, well, let me start. The Belva Lockwood uh, Award Celebration is one of my personal favorites at, at GW Law and especially this exciting uh, year as we make our own history, <laughs> welcoming our school's first ever female Dean, Dana Bowen Matthew, and who you will hear from uh, more in just a minute. But to get us started, I thought we would share a short video entitled, Shall Not Be Denied, Belva and Lockwood, so you could learn more about the awards namesake. So I'm going to share my screen. On December 3rd, 1880, a 50-year-old attorney and educator from upstate New York rose to address the judges of the United States Supreme Court. It was the first time in the country's history that a woman would argue before the nation's highest judicial body. Belva Ann Lockwood was born in Royalton, New York, outside of Buffalo in 1830. By the age of 14, she was already teaching many of her young neighbors at the local elementary school. 
widowed at the age of 22 with an infant daughter, Lockwood realized she needed a better education to support herself. She attended the Genesee Wesleyan Seminary and went on to become the headmistress of the Lockport Union School and then headmistress of a girls' seminary in Owego, New York. She left upstate New York with a desire to study law, but found few law schools willing to admit a woman. She was finally accepted to the National University School of Law, but upon finishing her degree, was forced to petition President Ulysses S. Grant for justice after the school refused to give her her diploma. She argued for acceptance into the Bar Association, but was refused, compelling her to draft and then lobby for an anti-discrimination bill, which would give her access. It was passed in 1879. Lockwood would go on to become the first female member of the United States Supreme Court Bar Association and the first to argue before the nation's highest judicial body. Lockwood would later become the first woman to run for the American presidency as part of the National Equal Rights Party in 1884. Throughout her storied career, Lockwood would work for international peace, equal rights, and women's suffrage. Before she died in 1917, at the age of 86, Lockwood told a reporter that one day a woman will occupy the White House and it will be entirely on her own merits, she promised. No movement alone will put her there. Well, I will tell you, um, I have watched that video in preparation a number of times for this event. And every time I see it, it gives me chills. Um, I know that we, you know, our futures are built on the shoulders of those that have gone before us. And Belva Lockwood so many years ago, um, you know, paved the way for many of us today. So hopefully if, you, if by now you didn't already know about Belva, Belva you now understand why it's so important for, uh, to us here at GW Law to continue to celebrate the life and accomplishments of this incredible pioneer and of our own alumna base. Speaking of female trailblazers, I am thrilled today to introduce Dr. Dana Bowen Matthew, Dean of the George Washington University Law School. She is a nationally recognized lawyer and legal scholar with three decades of industry and academic experience. Dean Matthew is the first woman to lead GW Law, an expert in health equity and public health policy with a passion for public service. Dean Matthew previously served as the University of Virginia Law School's William L. Matheson and Robert M. Morgenthal, Distinguished Professor of Law and the F. Palmer Weber Research Professor of Civil Liberties and Human Rights. She was also a professor of public health sciences at the UVA School of Medicine and served as director of the Equity Center at UVA, which works to build relationships between the university and its surrounding community to address racial and social economic inequality. Prior to her tenure at UVA, she served as Professor of Law, Vice Dean, and Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at the University of Colorado Law School, and before that, as Professor of Law and Medicine at the University of Kentucky College of Law. Dean Matthew has held a number of important positions in the policy world. She has served as a Robert Wood Johnson Health, Fellows, Health Policy Fellow for, U, for U.S. Senator Debbie Sabinow and as senior advisor in the Office of Civil Rights at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. She is also a non-resident fellow in the Center for Health Policy at the Brookings Institution. A prolific writer, she is the author of the book Just Medicine, A Cure for Racial Inequality in American Healthcare, and has authored or co-authored dozens of book chapters and articles fo focusing largely on healthcare reform, public health law, health disparities, patient protection, and antitrust laws and civil rights. Dean Matthew received a BA in economics from Harvard Radcliffe College, a JD from the University of Virginia School of Law, a PhD in health and behavioral sciences from the University of Colorado, Denver. A visionary and strategic leader, we are absolutely thrilled to have her as our Dean. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dana Bowen Matthew. What a kind introduction. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, I'm also gonna thank you for that film. I had never seen it before. I am inspired. Belva and I are here together in my office. I have to say, um, I'm gonna go so far off script. I know everybody who wrote these talking points is really trembling in their shoes, but this is too <laughs> emotional for me today. Uh, my friend, my mentor, my inspiration, Dean Danielle Conway is the recipient of the first time ever I get to award or speak at the award uh, ceremony. I have uh, nothing but thanks, Ty, for your leadership uh, and the amazing job that you're doing welcoming me and leading women in this school. And I'm gonna try and get on the letters of this uh, set of talking points, but I gotta tell you, this is just such a great day in my view. So hello and welcome. My name is Dana Matthew. I'm the Dean of the George Washington University Law School. And it is my great privilege to welcome you all alumna, students, faculty, and guests to the Belleville Lockwood Award Celebration, an annual highlight in this law school's calendar. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon. On behalf of the entire GW community, I would like to thank the Law Association for Women, uh, the GW Law Alumni Association for hosting this event, and I thank you, Nancy, for you and your great team for organizing it. I am the first woman dean at GW Law, and I'm excited to join this community where women have been opening doors and shattering glass ceilings for centuries. I love that for a cent more than a century, but we're not done yet. We've got a few more to smash. On August 26th of this year, just a few weeks after I arrived at GW, our nation celebrated the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment which of course, you know, granted women the constitutional right to vote, stating that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. It is amazing to think that just 40 years before women gained the right to vote, Belva Lockwood was sworn in as the first woman member of the bar of the United States Supreme Court and she went on to run for president twice thereafter. She's a towering figure in the history of American women. Uh, she graduated from our law school in 1873 and of course was one of the first women attorneys in the United States. She was a champion of women's rights and an active member of of course the women's suffrage organizations. She drafted in addition anti-discrimination bills to have the same access to the bar as men and laws that granted all qualified women attorneys the right to practice in any federal court. As well, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1873. Belva passed away in 1917, just three years before the 19th Amendment was passed. In 1986, she was honored by the US Postal Service with a Great American Series postage stamp. For the past 26 years, this being the 27th of course, GW Law has celebrated and honored Belva's accomplishments and those of her fellow GW Law alumni through this award service in partnership with outstanding student groups such as the Association for Law Women. It's my privilege to introduce you today to Belva Lockwood Award recipient, Dean Danielle Conway. She received her LLM from our law school in 1996. Of course, Dean Conway is the Dean of the Penn State University Dickinson Law School, which is a leading law school in the fight against anti-racism. Yes, I'm off script already. I am sorry, I'm gonna to have to talk about this because you've been such an inspiration to me. Uh, she is a leading expert in procurement law, entrepreneurship, intellectual property law. Dean Conway moved from faculty to administration with a plan to bring more women and underrepresented individuals into law schools and to bring balance to the profession. At Penn State Dickinson, she is the first woman and the first person of color to lead the law school. But wait, there's more. As Dean 
Dean Conway focuses on the law's fundamental purpose to foster an organized, civilized society and to create collective community engagement and progress. She inspires students to see this law as the power to protect individuals, and I quote, and their communities by drawing on core values such as liberty, equality, equity, inclusiveness, and fairness. Dean Conway previously served for four years as Dean of the University of Maine Law School. And for 14 years, she was on the faculty of the University of Hawaii and the William S. Richardson School of Law, where she was the inaugural Michael J. Marks Distinguished Professor of Business Law. Dean Conway is the dean among deans. She is a leader among leaders. She is reshaping the legal academy and, lead, and I have to say, I am a beneficiary thereof. She is the architect of the AALS's Law Dean's Anti-Racist Clearinghouse Project, which is creating a space for new and experienced deans and all collective leaders of the academy to engage in the fight for justice and equality in the way that we teach, in the way that we write, in the way that we program, and in the way that we lead. Prior to her deanship, Dean Conway was a member of the faculties of the Georgetown Law Center, the University of Memphis Cecil C. Humphreys School of Law. She also served as a Fulbright Senior Scholar in Australia and later as Chair of Law at La Trobe University of Faculty of Law and Management. I have to also add here that while here at GW, Dean Conway was a member of our faculty and served as the E.K. Gubin Visiting Professor of Government Contracts Law. If you want to hear more about her work, please come to the Anti-Racism or How to Build an Anti-Racist Law School luncheon on November 11th at 12 noon, where she will also be a featured speaker. Indeed, as I said, she is Dean of Deans and reshaping the Legal Academy. In 2016, Dean Conway retired from the United States Army, reaching the rank of Lieutenant Colonel after 27 years of combined active, reserve, and National Guard service. Dean Conway is the author or editor of six books and case books, as well as numerous book chapters, articles, and essays. Her scholarly agenda and speeches have focused on advocating for public education, for actualizing the rights of marginalized groups, including indigenous peoples, minorities, and members of rural communities, to name a few. Dean Conway promotes service among her students as a fundamental pillar of our profession. And as she so eloquently states, the constant threat of service is strengthening human interaction. The one-on-one -on -one helping relationships that create the ties that bind us together. Our profession is about relating to others and more importantly, serving the othered. The overarching principle of the rule of law, this is how Dean Conway sees our calling and our mission. She concludes, stated more plainly, we serve as a means to protect the most vulnerable among us. If you don't have chills, you should see the ones that I have. Dean Conway grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As one of four children, she credits her mother's intrepid spirit as her guide on how to live, love, and work. She now resides in Carlisle, Pennsylvania with her husband, a venerable barbecue bastard, and their eight-year-old son, a budding Suzuki violinist, with whom she often accompanies by piano. Congratulations, Dean Conway. I cannot think of a more deserving recipient of the 2020 Belva Lockwood Award. We are proud to call you an alumna of this law school. Do I speak now or do I just marvel at all that stuff you made up? <laughs> so thank you so much. There is nothing like coming home. Thank you for welcoming me home to George Washington University Law School. There's so many wonderful people on this call and I just want you to know I totally love you all 
and I'm really excited to share some comments with you. <clears throat> so thank you, Dean Dana Bowen Matthew, AKA Rockstar. Thank you, the George Washington University Law School, the Law Association for Women, and the George Washington Office of Law Alumni Relations for welcoming me into the Belva Lockwood Society. I'm so excited. I want to also give warm greetings and recognition to my friends and colleagues, Karen DuPont Thornton, Christopher R. Eukins, Stephen L. Schooner, and Joshua I. Schwartz. As well, I would like to recognize my dear mentor and friend, Professor Frederick James Lee, who passed away just recently on July 17th, 2020. He was a lovely human, a delightful teacher, and a major contributor to my professional success. You can tell I'm a little moved by this. Um, I miss him very much. Let me say that the people I have just acknowledged are part of my genealogy, and I consider them part of my sisterhood as women or as women's rights men and brothers. So in that spirit, I dedicate these remarks to them. As well, I will be making a gift to GW Law School in honor of Frederick Lee. Dr. Belva Lockwood, succeeding in four fronts, teacher and educator, lawyer and attorney, public speaker and lecturer and wife and mother. In recognition of a life so full and so impressive, I say to you and I urge you also to say, I too am Belva. Hannah Bennett, Belva's mother, supported her ambitious daughter, both morally and financially. Belva was a student who at the age of 15 rose to the position of teacher in Royalton, New York area country schools. Belva was committed to furthering her education, so much so that she made an immense sacrifice. After her first husband died, Belva decided to live apart from her young daughter for three years to pursue a college education. I know that we as parents can really appreciate that sacrifice. Her motivation for doing this is best described in her own words. To so thoroughly educate myself that I might ever thereafter respectably support myself and daughter and educate the latter. This is the kernel that grew to be the theme of this remarkable woman's life. It is also a theme that animates me and how I have walked my path as a woman, a wife, and a mother. More at though is what Belva dedicated her life to achieving, educating her daughter according to a women's rights tradition, as well as representing the interests of the other in our society. In forming this ethos, Belva embodied the term progressive feminist. Only relatively recently, over the past nine years in fact, I have, become to, I have come to identify myself as a Black feminist. Nine years, that might seem arbitrary, but I assure you it is not. This timing coincides with the birth of my son, Emmanuel. My Black feminism has only become more pronounced in 2020. Here's why. In January of this year, 
I committed Penn State Dickinson Law to host the American Bar Association's 19th Amendment traveling exhibit. And speaking with my leadership team, predominantly women-led, I concluded it would be more impactful to teach an intensive course to coincide with the ABA exhibit. That exhibit would be on display in the law school's atrium in October of 2020, but I didn't just want students to walk past it and say, oh, those are nice pictures. So in response to bolstering our understanding about the 19th Amendment, I decided to teach an intensive course titled Women's Suffrage, the 19th Amendment and the Duality of a Movement. I had no indication that I would be teaching this course in any other format than in the classroom. But the title of the course was eerily prescient. On January 13th, the first COVID-19 case was confirmed. On February 23rd, Ahmad Arbery was corralled by three white men and murdered. On March 11th, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic. On March 12th, the US stock market plummeted. And dreadfully ironic, two events intersected on March 13th. Breonna Taylor was murdered in her apartment by white plainclothes police officers at 12.40 AM. And later that day, President Trump declared a national emergency due to the pandemic. And the tipping point for millions of people all along our human diaspora, on May 25th, we all watched for eight minutes and 46 seconds as George Floyd was murdered by Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, aided by officers Kong, Lane, and Tao. Against the backdrop of the coronavirus global pandemic, which is disproportionately impacting black and brown people, the heightened social movement demanding racial equality following the cascade of murders I just recited, and an impending presidential election in which voter tampering, voter fraud, and voter suppression are on full display, I knew that I had to channel the pain that I know you are seeing right now of these societal catastrophes in the only way I knew how, to advocate with my power to educate. I took a page out of Belva Lockwood's book. As well, I called on the ancestors, Black women, universal suffragists, Sojourner Truth, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, and Mary Ann Shad Carey to summon my strength for the days and months that lay ahead. Belva was a teacher who knew very well the power of education but she was no pushover. And yes, she loved her students, but not enough to be paid much less than men teachers for the same work. Belva left her teaching position because she could not reconcile being a principal of a school making $400 a year while an assistant male teacher made $600 a year. So she took action. She moved with her daughter, Laura, to become the principal at another country school in Gainesville, Wyoming County, and then on to the Hornellsville School. And she moved again to the Oswego Female Seminary. These moves were necessitated by her respect for her professional capacity and the very principle of equality 
which meant insisting on being paid a salary equal to that which was paid to men. In 1866, at the age of 35, Belva moved to Washington, D.C. to start a school that aligned with her advanced ideas. Two years later, she married Reverend Ezekiel Lockwood, a staunch supporter of her professional ambitions. In the spirit of Frederick Douglass, you would call Ezekiel Lockwood a women's rights man. In 1868, Belva and her husband organized the Washington chapter of the Equal Rights Association. The surviving organization after the merger of anti-slavery societies and the Women's Rights Society. Importantly, the initial meeting and many thereafter were held in the parlor of the Lockwood home and their sessions were attended by ladies and gentlemen of both colors. In contrast to the single issue advocacy of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony that evolved to focus exclusively on the voting rights of white women, the object of Belva's Washington chapter of the Equal Rights Association was to secure equal rights for all Americans, regardless of race, color, or sex. At times, Belva's stance on universal suffrage placed her at odds with Stanton and Anthony. But Belva had many other mentors and coalition partners. I previously mentioned Mary Ann Shad Carey. Carey featured as a mentor of sorts to Belva when both women served on the Colored National Labor Union's Committee on Female Suffrage a committee headed by Carrie. Both Belva and Marianne were both teachers by training and both separately experiencing the challenge of raising a child while intermittently running a single parent home. It is likely that their bond as women suffrage activists at the CNLU endured. I pause again to highlight this vital point. Belva, through her experiences and her friendships across the color line, presents as a true practitioner of sisterhood. Belva instructs us all with her understanding of the power of sisterhood and the adherence to the principles of universalism. Like Belva, I too experienced the power of sisterhood it's in attempting to cope with the cascade of killings of black and brown bodies while leading an institution that by definition is responsible for promoting the rule of law, especially for the most vulnerable among us. Working with four black women law deans, I co-curated the Association of American Law Schools Law Deans Anti-Racist Clearinghouse Project. You say that five times. A defining feature of this project is the collective voice spoken by the deans, not just the Black women deans, but the deans at over 200 law schools, unapologetically proclaiming condemnation for the violence against Black and Brown bodies while pledging to teach and learn according to anti-racist principles. Like Belva, like Francis, like Mary Ann and Ida and many others. My sister deans and I built a coalition among deans to speak as one to recommit to dismantling racism and deconstructing bias in our law schools in service to universalism. This triumph in no way dulls the pain that we feel when we experience senseless racial violence. And it, it certainly does not prevent my contemplating the harm that may befall my own 
black sun's body. Moreover, it does not account for the mental gymnastics that I need to perform to compartmentalize these haunting images so that I can park them in a place that allows me to get through the next few minutes of my work day. What I can say is that there is a separate and distinct joy in contributing to the betterment of society generally and building capacity in the next generation of lawyers specifically. This is what Belva knew about the power and the promise of education. I return once again to the intensive course that I prepared to commemorate the anniversary of the 19th Amendment. While only a four week course, I can say that every practice, teaching and publishing experience I have had up to now prepared me for this very moment to teach women's suffrage, the 19th Amendment and the duality of a movement. The students in the course identify as a queer woman, a trans woman, white women, an African man and a white man to the last person. They are voraciously consuming the materials. Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality theory, James and Lois Horton's legal histories discussing the Fugitive Slave Acts, Martha S. Jones's Vanguard, how black women broke barriers, won the vote and insisted on equality for all, and the building of coalitions across race and gender lines. In this class, we are sharing our authentic selves and our strategy for a new movement. While many of us in the course are lamenting what we were not taught previously, we are soaking in what we are privileged to learn now. J. Clay Smith, Howard University law professor, also passed away, is the author of Emancipation, The Making, of the Black Lawyer 1844 to 1944. And he described Belva Lockwood in the seminal work as a progressive white woman lawyer who motioned for the admission of at least two black men lawyers, Samuel Lowry and Shelby James Davidson into the bar of the United States Supreme Court where she herself was admitted in 1879 being the first woman to be so recognized and honored after her long campaign of congressional advocacy. She worked for six years to get a bill through Congress that would allow her admission to the Supreme Court. The Lockwood bill dated March 3rd, 1879, opened the Supreme Court doors to women attorneys. Later, Belva's oldest surviving daughter, Lura, also went to law school and eventually became a clerk in her mother's office. I think about my road to teaching women's suffrage, the 19th Amendment and the duality of a movement. And I am confident that the path that led me here to this moment is also meant to pave the way for those students in this class. The way that I have made is meant to serve their futures and their transformed version of our society. And I'll close by saying, black church women are known for saying things like gonna make a way out of no way and ain't no time to be tired. These sayings describe Belva to a T. Belva did not have time to be tired. She was a legal advisor to women's suffragists. She was a member of the National Suffrage Association and addressed the House Judiciary Committee on behalf of women's suffrage. She represented the Eastern Cherokee Indian Nation against the United States government on a claim that the federal government breached its treaty obligations. 
She was nominated in 1884 and 1888 as the presidential candidate for the Equal Rights Party ticket. She did this while keeping all women and men in her heart. And she stayed true to her pledge to educate her daughter, Lura, and to represent the interests of the othered in our society. She did this while remaining true to the gift that is sisterhood. With the honor you have bestowed on me this afternoon, I pledge my sisterhood to all of you as I continue to, at times, make a way out of no way. Thank you for seeing me and being with me on this path. Wow. The program says I'm supposed to say something at this point, but I, I got through that without crying. Oh my I, gosh. The rest <laughs> of us did not. <laughs> the rest of us did not. Oh my. As you went to the black church, I have to say, I, was, I had my mute on because I was brought up in the tradition of the black church. So nobody could hear me saying throughout your speech, well, well, as you were going, I was going too. So I will say that I have to add one more of the phrases from the Black church tradition, just having heard your remarks, Dean Conway. And that is, I don't feel no ways tired. There it is. Not anymore. There it is. You have done, has inspired me for the next leg of our journey here at GW Law. We are so proud of you. And now that I know Belva, oh my gosh, I'm so proud of her as well. And I'm proud to be affiliated. I thought I came to this law school because of the tradition of it being founded at the close of the Civil War. I thought that you know, that transition from the bloody Civil War to the Reconstruction was the DNA and it still pushes me forward. But now that I know that one woman, Belva Lockwood, has made such a difference, we might have to award a new title to this. It has to be from now on, maybe the Belva Lockwood and Danielle Conway Award <laughs> because of what you have done. Uh, but in the audience, there are some other recipients I want to acknowledge. Uh, Margaret Zwistler, are you with us? You were the 2014 recipient other Belva Lockwood Award recipients who are with us, members of Dean Conway's graduating class. Are you here? Raise your hand, do that hand thing if you're here. Usually I'd have you stand up. There might be other people that I'm missing. I know you all want a chance to talk, but it doesn't say here I'm allowed to give you a chance to talk. So I'm sorry, I can't <laughs> open the mic. I've got to be a rule follower here and just close. If there was ever a doubt in your mind that one person, one determined woman could make a difference. You have met one from history, Belva Lockwood, and one who today is carrying forth that legacy. One who today is changing all of our lives and leading us to ask ourselves, what is our part in changing history today? One person recently said to me, oh, don't do it like that, Dean, Dean Matthew. No Dean has done it like that. You shouldn't do it that way. I have to tell you, I consider that a compliment. No Dean has done it like that because, well, Dean Conway has told me today that we're gonna redefine Dean and how it's done. Thank you for your inspiration. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your transformation. Everyone, I wanna say thank you. I think I've reached the end of the program. Is there anything you want me to do, Nancy, before I adjourn us? I just wanna say thank you to everyone. Danielle, raise high, raise ever high.
Danielle, don't go away quite yet. I won't. Yeah, I was going to say if some people wanted to stay on to chit chat and catch up, we can leave it. We can leave this open. Okay. And I would definitely love to work out some way that my colleagues and I, my classmates and I, we can we can fund something in Fred Lee's name. That would just be awesome. That is amazing. Now tell me a little bit more about Fred Lee because that's oh my gosh. Name. And I'm sorry, I know it's very emotional. Oh. That was recent too. I know, Steve. Can you do it while I cry a little bit? So. So when, oh, in, in some ways, in, in a position similar to the position I originally had in Chris's, Fred came to the program many, many, many years ago, back in the 1980s, to work with Ralph Nash and John Sabinick. He was a fascinating guy at so many different levels because he had a patent background and originally led Rose to the level of chief judge of the administrative of the Board of Contract Appeals at NASA. Fascinating guy. Ralph and John brought him over to, in effect, be the program director. And he was a mentor to many of us, uh, Danielle, me, others. And when I joined the faculty, we overlapped for a number of years. And I believe Chris was even lucky enough to overlap with him early in his career as well. But you could not imagine a kinder or gentler or warmer person, in addition to, of course, being brilliant and accomplished, but the warmth that exuded from him. And we knew it because we knew his children, who were all obviously adults. We knew it because this was the guy who was always the sports coach and the referee. And you'd always run into people, oh, you won't remember this Coach Lee's butt. But that kind of mentorship and warmth, he's all the thing that the rest of us aspire to do and fail to be every day. So... I mean, that's where I start. Yeah, and, and I think I've composed myself enough. Um, he was all of those things. And he was not just an administrator in a very large organization. Um, my colleague, Steve Schooner, knows that I was in the honors program at the US Army Corps of Engineers. And I had two really unfortunate events, racialized events in that position. And Judge Lee's taught me and others our classes at night. So I would go to class from 6 to 10 p.m. Those were, whew, those were sessions, two nights a week. And I remember the day that I, I went, I said, Judge Lee's after class, can I talk with you? Again, this is 10 p.m. at night. Mm -hmm. And he sat with me for what had to be almost two hours telling me how to handle the situation that I was embroiled in by virtue of my womanness and blackness. And he gave me his time, not just that night. I remember walking over, you know, we don't do this anymore, COVID, to those group of buildings that, that where the, the restaurants are. And he would just walk over with me and we'd have a meal or we have coffee. And he would ask me, is this still going on? Do I need to get involved? How can I help? And I told him, this is the help, you know, this is the help just talking me through this and letting me know I was legit. That was Fred Lee's. That explains so much. I don't. Uh, I don't want to out you too much, but um, Dean Conway has organized a, a group of mentoring sessions for new deans, um, and we meet once every I don't know couple of months, uh, and everything from the mundane. Here's how you should keep your calendar to the enormous, here are the kinds of things people will think but not say about you in your new role. They go over them and that would be amazing. We have sessions that last maybe four or five hours on Saturdays, but then I'll email and I'll say, Danielle, can I just talk to you a little bit while longer about this or that or the other? And you'll just jump right on spend time. And at first I thought, oh, 
She loves GW. She wants GW. <laughs> I bet that has something to do with it. And then I thought, oh, she loves women deans. She loves women deans. That's it. And I bet that has something to do with it. But it's just in your DNA. It's who you are to give and to help people who want to change society for the better. It's where you're coming from, right? I'm looking at your AALS Law Dean's Anti-Racist Clearinghouse Project. Like I said, reshaping the academy. It is paradigm shifting. And you all just set that up and sent it out. And it's a resource for all of us. So thank you. Yeah, and you have such a good group of faculty there. Oh, you. Um, these people on this call, my brothers, my sister. I don't know where Karen is. Where is Karen? So, so Karen. <laughs> Karen has actually left us and has gone to work on the House Armed Services Committee. Oh. Where she's, she's doing a great job. I just talked to her the other night. So uh, that was that was a big move for her. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, and, and Dana, in terms of the history of this, Karen and Danielle and Kathy, who we were talking about earlier, share the experience from the CORE's Honors Program in different ways and have overlapping aspects to all that as well. Uh, one other thing I just want to mention before I forget, and I'm going to send you a separate email on this, Danielle, but Fred's daughter would love to hear some of the stories that you told. Mm -hmm. I know that someone has dropped into the chat box Fred's obituary, and many of us have commented, and mm -hmm. I added some pictures in there as well. But I, I mean, look, I've known Fred's daughter for decades. She would she would greatly appreciate that. So I'm going to pass on her email to you. Okay. Well, I would love that. And if Nancy could work something out um, so that I can also uh, give my, my gift in his name, but also maybe try to encourage others to recognize him, that would be great. All right, I gotta go boo hoo and a, a, a glass of red wine or something. Cause you, you. I just want to make sure. <laughs> on this. Don't boo hoo yet. Uh, okay. Is there anybody? Let me just ask Amanda, Irving, Karen. Oh yeah, of course. Can I just hear who you All are? All right, let me let me go get a tissue. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. Well, you know. A big right. one. <laughs> Chris, we met. That was awesome, Dana. Very nicely done. Oh, Good you're job. kidding me. I'm, I, I, I just am full of emotion. This is the amazing person who has done amazing things. And now that I know, Belva's statue is going to stay right where she is. <laughs> you're going to be watching me. I'm watching you. I want to see what you're doing here. <laughs> I don't know. Dean Pagel's pretty protective about Belva. Oh, my goodness. You had to see how he arranged everything. He told me everything had to be off my desk. He told me what she was made of. And I'm about to give him some money to put brass or bronze or something all around her. <laughs> Every year, he's very protective about Belva. So we had to convince him to take Belva out of the case and bring him to your office. <laughs> I love her. I love her being here. She's an inspiration. And the fact that she was a mom, mm -hmm. that's where you almost got me. Because tomorrow, oh, Lord, tomorrow my son is coming home uh -huh. after what I would consider a walkabout, we shall call it. A yeah. walkabout. A walkabout. Yes. He graduated from Berkeley Law School two years ago. He failed the California bar. When you meet him, you could tell him I told you. <laughs> <laughs> right after... He decided he was going to quit his pretty good playing job to become an activist. Well, an yeah. Activist. Well, yeah. <laughs> I want to know how that pays, right? An activist. <laughs> so he's sending me pictures of himself in gas masks and he's powering to the people. And I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus, please keep my son. I mean, I, you don't want to hear what I have to say. All he needs to do is get on TikTok. He's going to be fabulous. He's a job. <laughs> That's what he really needs. But something about being uh, the woman of a black male. I have almost made the transition to calling myself a black progressive feminist. I'm not there yet. I will tell you, we'll have to have that long conversation. Uh, but something about being the mother of a black male during these times in these United States, right? Mm -hmm. Has re-energized me 
for mm -hmm. the cause, right? The last leg of the journey. I was thinking, yeah, this is my last gig. Let me just, you know, do this well and call it good. No, mm -hmm. no, no. This world is going to have to be just a little bit better before I leave because of what it means to watch what we have seen in 2020 mm -hmm. from a racial unrest perspective, from an inequality perspective, from an injustice perspective, we got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. so I, yeah, uh, and, I, and I'm very serious about that. Hey, Ema, come here. <laughs> I'm very, I'm, I got to show him to Kristen and Steve. Um, I know. Can you bring my, my baby? Emmanuel. That's that's my big baby. Right? <laughs> He's like, can you bring my baby? You mean me? <laughs> <laughs> they they often get confused. I but, saw that I saw that violin picture the other day. I almost fell out of my chair. I know. So Dana, what you have to also know is Chris Eugens and Steve Schooner. They got me through some tough times when uh, I was trying to have this little man, and. Uh, that's why I know that you got good people there. All right, I'm gonna take a screenshot right now. <laughs> All right, you gotta show your face, man. Can you say hi to Uncle Chris and Uncle Steve? Yes. Hello. No, no, no. Hello. I'm just wait. Where's the violin? <laughs> don't, don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't. That's not that kind of call. <laughs> <laughs> But Dana, these two men got me through one of the roughest times in my life that a woman can go through. And that's I, how I know you got good men there. Steve and Chris, she told me that already. I've tried to go light and not. He's telling stories. She's the bomb. She needed us like a fish needs a bicycle. No. I heard. I heard. It's like, Chris, when you were talking about the uh, online education, I was like, any excuse. Let me just let me just tell Chris I need to talk to him. Mm -hmm. Where Steve gets calls for me on Saturday. Steve, I was just wondering. <laughs> yeah, that's how you know you, you're living right, right there. So is he, did you say he's nine already? Can you believe it? He's nine. Oh my God, he smells. <laughs> <laughs> it gets worse at 12, trust me. Oh my God. <laughs> Sneakers go outside, Danielle. Sneakers go oh. out. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go. I love you. <laughs> but he's fun. I have to go do a promo for NASPO. Oh, okay. Tell everybody say hey. You did a really nice job. Everybody, Thank what a pleasure. You. Thank you. For We're very proud of you, Daniel. Exactly what Thank we Thank you, Chris. That was fabulous. Well done, everyone. Thank you. Congratulations, Danielle. Thank you, Dana. I'll see Thank you soon. Okay. Thanks, everybody.